Welcome, dear friends, to part two of part 15 of Exploring the Advent of Divine Justice. And in these sections, we'll be covering paragraphs 53 through 58. Thank you so much. And without any further ado, we'll have our opening prayer. O oh, thou loving provider, these souls have hearkened to the summons of the kingdom and have gazed upon the glory of the Son of Truth. They have risen upward to the refreshing skies of love. They are enamored of thy nature and they worship thy beauty. Unto thee have they turned themselves, speaking together of thee, seeking out thy dwelling and thirsting for the water brooks of thy heavenly realm. Thou art the giver, the bestower, the ever loving. Abdul Baha. Beautiful, Keith. Thank you so much. So, dear friends, so excited to be with you tonight. So, let me share my screen. Let me see. Share. Okay, here we go. Now, dear friends, as you recall, in our last session, we whirlwinded through paragraphs 53 through 58 last time. And in fact, some friends thought that was it. We actually did all the paragraph, you know, it and had summarized it. But no, dear friends, we're going to go through it in detail in this section. So let us read the introduction and study, because if we re try to reread all these paragraphs, again, it will take a long time. So we're just going to go through the introduction, and then uh, key points, and then into the study of it, okay? So it, on yourselves, I encourage you to reread these paragraphs, because to just reread them straight, it would take half an hour again. So let us move on, dear friends, and so we can um, get through this section together. So the introduction that I have here for you for these paragraphs states, the beloved guardian explains the Baha'i perspective on the issue of racism in light of the core teachings of Baha'u'llah, the unity of mankind. He also provides a strategy for both black and white to abandon racial prejudice and achieve racial unity. The beloved guardian, Shoghi Effendi, cites a number of statements from Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha on the unity of mankind and abandonment of all types of prejudices. So this is my short, brief summary of these paragraphs. And let us now go to the key points that I've outlined for you. So our first reader is Miss Dini. Good to see you, Miss Dini. You are our first reader. So go for it. <clears throat> Major key points from paragraphs 53 to 58. Abdul Baha acknowledges that physical diversity of human beings is caused by environmental factors. Any form of discrimination based on race is strongly condemned in the Baha'i teachings. Excellent. And could you read the next one? Abdul Baha rejects the biological concept of race and confirms that the concept of race is a social reality constructed, promoted, and accepted by the human mind. According to the Baha'i teachings, there is only one human species. While the con construct of race is based on some physical differences, it has no reality. Discriminating against a particular group of people because of physical char characteristics, Sorry. such as skin color, is unacceptable. Excellent. Very well read, Miss Dini. Thank you. Okay. And our next reader will be Miss Gabrielle McGuire. Go for it, Miss Gabrielle. The beloved guardian explained that discrimination based on race is only acceptable if it is in the form of positive discrimination in favor of minorities. Tremendous effort is required by both 
white and black races in their relationship with each other to reflect the spirit and teachings of the faith. Abandoning forever the false doctrine of racial superiority. Although universally condemned in principle, racism has survived as a social attitude. Excellent. Very well read, Ms. Gabrielle. Thank you. And one more. Go for it, Ms. Gabrielle. Read this one, please, also. So this is, uh, now we're going to be start studying these paragraphs. Go for it. <clears throat> the high perspective on race. In paragraph 53, the beloved guardian explains that the Baha'i perspective on the issue of racism, while humanity, human diversity is acknowledged in the Baha'i faith as being desirable, any form of discrimination based on race is strongly condemned. The principle of the unity of mankind that embraces human diversity is the core teaching of the revelation of Baha'u'llah and reflects its opposition to any type of racism. Excellent, beautifully read, thank you. So the core principle of the revelation of Baha'u'llah is the oneness of mankind, the unity of mankind. So if someone asked, what does the Baha'i faith stand for? Very simply, the unity of mankind. So this is the core principle. And as Baha'is, this is something that we should not only promote, we should also promulgate it in, the, in, our, in our inner lives and our outer lives. So this is, as I as said, the core principle of the faith. The beloved guardian here explicitly highlights this important teaching of the faith. And this is from a letter written in 1935. This is what he writes. In regard to your question concerning the Baha'i attitude towards the colored race, it is only evident that the principle of the oneness of mankind, which is the main pivot round which all the teachings of Baha'u'llah revolve, precludes the possibility of considering race as a, bar, as a bar to any intercourse, be it social or otherwise. The faith indeed, by its very nature and purpose, transcend all racial limitations and differences and proclaims the basic and essential unity of the entire human race. Racial prejudice of whatever nature and character is therefore severely condemned and as such should be wiped out by the friends in all their relations, whether private or social. So does the faith stand for any form of racism? Of course not. The faith stands for the oneness of humanity, right? This is, it is at the very core of what the faith stands for. It is says, it is at the very pivot of what the faith stands for, oneness of humanity. So this is, if, as I said, if to define yourself first and foremost, we are promoters of the oneness of humanity. The beloved guardian, Shor Effendi, strongly asserts in paragraph 53 that discrimination against any race on the ground of its being socially backward, politically immature, and numerically in a minority is what? A flagrant violation of the spirit that animates the faith of Baha'u'llah. Any form of discrimination is a flagrant violation of the spirit that animates the faith of Baha'u'llah. So these, dear friends, are things that we have to bring into account in our inner life and address them in our communities, right? And so as we march along on this section, we're going to see what not only the whites, but also as the blacks, as, as, and also as the greater community, as the Baha'i community, and then the greater, greater community. What do we have to do as individuals 
to take on this challenge. This is a direct quote from the advent of divine justice. Could someone please read this for me? Go ahead. You have the floor. Every organized community enlisted under the banner of Baha'u'llah should feel it to be its first and inescapable obligation to nurture, encourage, and safeguard every minority belonging to any faith, race, class, or nation within it. So this is actually from these paragraphs that we just read. And... I just want to show you where it is because I actually put it in blue. So it is right there. You see it in paragraph 53. You see that? Every organized community. That is what dear Miss Deborah just read. So this is what every organized community enlisted under this banner of Baha'u'llah should do. So in every assembly, this should be part of our mandate. What we should be doing, trying to safeguard every minority, encourage and nurture every minority, every committee, every group, we should be working towards this. So this is something that is an obligation, inescapable obligation that we have to be doing. And these are, on the left is one of my favorite quotes of dear Martin Luther King. It says, we have flown the air like birds and swum the sea like fishes, but have yet to learn the simple act of walking the earth like brothers. And then this is on the right. I share this quote from the Baha'i International Community. And I'm going to get my dear friend, Miss Mahnaz John, to read this one. Mahnaz John, you're up. Go for it. From the Baha'i perspective, racism is one of the most gainful, painful, that's right, gainful, gainful. and persistent evil in society. Racial discrimination is baneful because it violates the dignity of humanity, human beings, and yet it persists. Racism is poisonous because it cripples its uh, victims, corrupt its per per perpetrators. Oh my gosh, perpetrators and lights human progress. Beautifully read. Thank you, Mahnaz John. Some hard words in there. Baneful. My dear friend Don is going to be looking up these words, I assume. Baneful. So, and then we have another word uh, in here. So, so this is, uh, racism is one of the most baneful, persistent evils. And racial discrimination it violates the dignity of human beings. And it is poisonous. We constantly hear that racism is cancerous, right? And racism is a weed. These are terms. So racism is poisonous because it cripples its victims, corrupts its perpetrators, and blights human progress. Beautiful quote. And so these are things that when we ever talk on this subject, this is a quote that should come to our mind. So then it says, don't let the world divide us when God created us to love each other, right? So the world is constantly trying to divide us. But how many times do we constantly see God is trying to bring us together, right? So let us continue to see what our dear Lord is asking for us. His Holiness Abdul Baha acknowledges that physical diversity of human beings. Remember, Abdu'l-Baha, of course, saw differences. Remember the story of the young African-American boy 
you know, the black boy and that he put uh, that sweet to his face and said, you were this, as sweet as that, you know, savor. Of, of course, His Holiness Abdul Baha saw color. When we say God doesn't see color, of course, His Holiness Abdul Baha saw colors. But it's the beauty of the colors. It's the diversity and the richness. But where do these colors come from? This is where it says, Abdul Baha acknowledges that physical diversity of human beings is caused by environmental factors, and science has proved this, resulting in different colors of skin, facial features, heights, and other physical characteristics. And this is in a talk given at Hull House in Chicago. So Linus Abdul Baha states that such differences, though observed between individuals, should be treated as being less important than the similarities. So the differences are less important than the similarities. This is what he states. In the human kingdom itself, there are points of contact, properties common to all mankind. Likewise, there are points of distinction which separate race from race, individual from individual. If the points of contact, which are the common properties of humanity, overcome the peculiar points of distinction, unity is assured. On the other hand, if the points of differentiation overcome the points of agreement, disunion and weakness result. So here, by the points of contact, Abdul Baha means similarities in this sense. So in this realm of reality, we're seeing that there are far more points of contact, the, the terminology of Abdul Baha. There are far more similarities. In the human genome, we know 99.9% .9 similar to each other. This is fact. This is science. So if I go to any random human being across this globe and I look at my DNA as opposed to anyone else, we are 99.9% .9 similar. This is science. So these differences are, as Abdul Baha said, are far less, you know, significant, uh, insignificant compared to the similarities. This is what Abdul Baha said. And this is from a quote from Baha'u'llah. He says, all peoples and nations are of one family. So now we have one more quote. Uh, this was a hard quote to make a picture of, so I left it as is. So, so I'm going to have my dear friend, Dennis McGregor. You're going to read this one for me. Always good to hear you. So you're up. Sure. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Okay. And the Baha states, one of the important questions which affect the unity and the solidarity of mankind is the fellowship and equality of the white and colored races. Between these two races, certain points of agreement and points of distinction exist, which warrant just and mutual consideration. The points of contact are many. For in the material or physical plane of being, both are con constituted alike and exist under the same law of growth and bodily development. Furthermore, both, both live and move in the plane of the senses are endowed with human intelligence. There are many other mutual qualifications. In this country, the United States of America, patriotism is common to both races. All have equal rights to citizenship, speak one language, receive the blessings of the same civilization and follow the precepts of the same religion. In fact, numerous points of partnership and agreement exist between the two races, whereas the one point of distinction is that of color. Shall this, the least of all distinctions, be allowed to separate you as races and individuals? In physical bodies, in the law of growth, in sense endowment, intelligence, patriotism, language, citizenship, civilization, and religion, you are one and the same. A single point of distinction exists, that of racial color. 
God is not pleased with, neither should any reasonable or intelligent man be willing to recognize inequality in the races because of this distinction. Very well read. Thank you very much. So here, Abdul Baha again saying, should any reasonable or intelligent man be willing to recognize inequality between these races because of this singular distinction of, of color of skin? This is saying, if you're an intelligent man, how could you see this as a distinction just because of color of skin? Any thoughts so far? Do, we could, do you know, have a thought at this point? Any thoughts? Asan, I have one. And, and that sounds my, my dear friend, Miss Deborah. I'm going to, is that my, my right? Yes. Go for it. Um, the one thing I keep thinking about is that all of the Baha'is that became a Baha'i through um, one way or another, the reason we fell in love with the faith was mm. because of this point, mm. the unity of mankind. I know it did with, with it. Um, that was my main reason for becoming a Baha'i. It was my husband's reason for becoming a Baha'i. And all those in the last 40 years that I've met that have come into the faith, that has been their main thing. So it's very hard for me to understand why it should be an issue within the faith. That's a great question, dear Deborah. Because has it been internalized by the friends, you know? Has the friends internalized this principle of the oneness of mankind? Have the friends eradicated prejudice from their hearts? And so that no prejudice is left there, so that is the, the Baha'i faith a proper representation of what the vision of Abdul Baha is, you know? So... Um, we can scroll back to paragraph 52. And in paragraph 52, it's, you know, I'll just read it for you. And when it talks about the example of the master, and then again in paragraph 58, which we're going to come to again later. But this is something that I want to share with you. Does the Baha'i community have, are as we, me too, are we practicing these qualities in our life? And I share this with you. It says, let them remember, let them call to mind. Fearless, his fearless, his fearlessly and determinedly the example of conduct of Abdul Baha. His courage, his genuine love, his informal and indiscriminating fellowship, his contempt for and, and impatience of criticism, tempered by his tact and wisdom, his spontaneous sympathy for the downtrodden, his ever-abiding sense of the oneness of the human race, his overflowing love for its members. And I could keep reading, but dear friends, my point on this, and especially dear Deborah, is are we practicing that? Are we representative of his name in the sense of racial justice? And if we're not, we're seeing the issues within our community. And uh, you're absolutely right. The faith grew by great numbers because of this principle of the oneness of humanity. Yes, especially in the 60s and the 70s, there was mass teaching going on in South Carolina, North Carolina, especially around this principle of the oneness of humanity. But what has happened? The friends often go in phases, you know? This the and this is something that that's another reason why I felt impelled to share this as a presentation, because we need to revisit this, especially this subject. So you're absolutely right, dear Deborah. So we're moving on. Any other thoughts? I also have one thing to share before we move on. Um, one last thing is. I, in the last two weeks while I was sick, I, I was sitting at home and I just wanted to share this one anecdote. There is an incredible course, incredible course that's free on YouTube. 
um, by it's a Yale course on uh, that's offered, and it's African American history from um, from the point of 1865 to present. So it's an incredible overview of the history of African Americans coming out of slavery to present. So, and I encourage it. I will send the link to the whole class because I encourage you to uh, really, there's an incredible professor that really takes you through a period of great suffering and trial and tribulation and to see what has happened all the way up till to now. So I'll share that and encourage you in your spare time to listen to the YouTube's um, sessions to expand your knowledge on that. Okay, but moving on, dear friends. So, because we got to get through as much as we can, as always. His Holiness Abdul Baha, in another tablet, refers to the diverse groups of people in our world as races and tribes. In a word, the age is ours when fellowship is to be established. The century has come when all the nations are to be unified. The century has come when all the nations shall enjoy international peace. The century has come when all the races and tribes of the world shall do away with racial prejudice and associate fully. The century has arrived when all the natives of the world shall prove to be one home of the human family. Thus may mankind in its entirety rest comfortably and in peace under the great and broad tabernacle of the one Lord. Isn't that beautiful? The century has come. This is such beautiful words from Abdul Baha, calling on each one of us to bring these words to life. So this is also from the beloved guardian. I'm going to get my dear friend, Miss Kathy, your next reader. Go for it, Miss Kathy. Unification of the whole of mankind is the hallmark of the stage which human society is now approaching. Unity of family, of tribe, of city states and nation has been fully established. World unity is the goal toward which a harassed humanity is striving. Nation building has come to an end. The anarchy inherent in state sovereignty is coming to a climax. A world growing to maturity must abandon this fetish, recognize the oneness and wholeness of human relationships and establish once and for all the machinery that can best incarnate this fundamental principle of its life. Show you. Thank you, Miss Kathy. Thank you. So the diversity is the essence of perfection. Now, this is such a beautiful principle of the faith. Now we see what is the essence of perfection? It is diversity. And if we see each one of us as essences of perfection, when we come together, this is how we know what true perfection is. It's the beauty of our planet with all of its diversity in it. His Holiness Abdul Baha acknowledges human diversity and the translation uses the term race to refer to different groups of people with similar physical characteristics. His Holiness Abdul Baha rejects the bio biological concept of race and confirms that the concept of race is a social reality constructed, promoted, and accepted by the human mind. In a talk given in Paris, Abdul Baha highlights that the apparent multiple, multiplicity of religions, 
races, and nations are all divisions of man's making only and are necessary only in his thought. So all these divisions are man-made. Even the divisions of religion are man-made because this is the faith of God. One and unfolding. These divisions are man-made. Races, man-made. Nations are man-made. What is United States of America? These borders are all created by man. So all of these divisions are man-made. In another talk delivered at the Church of the Messiah in Montreal, Canada, His Holiness Abdul Baha states, all humanity are the children of God. They belong to the same family, to the same original race. There can be no multiplicity of races since all are the descendants of Adam. This signifies that racial assumption and distinction are nothing but superstition. In the estimate of God, there are no English, French, Germans, Turkish, or Persians. All these in the presence of God are equal. They are of one race and creation. God did not make these divisions. These distinctions have had their origin in man himself. Therefore, as they are against the plan and purpose of reality, they are false and imaginary. We are of one physical race, even as we are of one physical plan of material body, each endowed with two eyes, two ears, one head, and two feet. And this again, if on the bottom right, it says the earth has one surface. God has not divided the surface by boundaries and barriers to separate races and peoples. Any thoughts, dear friends? How do these words strike you? Can I ask a question, Esan? Please, please go ahead. Um, it says that they all belong to the same family, all, are all descendants of Adam. Can you add anything to that? What does that mean? In the sense of uh, descendants of one, in the sense of we are all from <coughs> one, it is not, I believe, and I, uh, Dr. Bait is with us uh, as, and others to make sure I'm not going in error, but it does not mean direct descendants of Adam in the sense of the prophet Adam. But it means that we are coming from one source, one uh, connection, one uh, humanity, one line in that sense. Then we are descendants of uh, the manifestation, Adam. Dr. Bat, please, uh, you just unmuted yourself, please. I think it's simpler to say that we are the outcome of one process. You see, our physical body comes through millions of years of evolution. But our spirit is a single entity that's been created. Our reality is our spirit, not our physical body. Our physical body has come through the nature and bears all aspects of impact of nature, as for example, environment and so on. The food we have eaten has resulted in some of us being taller, some of us being shorter. The elevation that we have lived has resulted in some of us having greater rest or taking more oxygen in and less at the sea level and so on. So we carry the impact of our environment. But in reality, we are all creation of the Lord and that's the spirit that we have. I think also it was common historically to refer to all of us as being children of Adam. Historically, it was understood to mean Adam and Eve. But we don't think of that kind of 
creation. Abdul Baha himself states that in some answered questions. So it's just an expression that we are all same creation. Thank you very much, Dr. Bayat. I have one more question. Is that okay for Dr. Bayat? Of course, dear Tesfai, please. Yeah, because is it Adam is to be the first man or the first messenger of God? Uh, you're quite right. In the writings is referred to that the Adam that often is being talked about is uh, the first messenger of God. But even that we have to think carefully about it. Because ever since mankind walked on earth, it, he was and she was the recipient of God's guidance. So when did this process of prophethood start? So that itself is also open to question. Best thing is to say traditionally, we have all said we are children of Adam, meaning we are of the same origin. That's what it means. Our body comes from nature and our spirit is the creation of the Lord. Our body bears the impact of environment and hence all these things we have been talking about today, height and color of skin and uh, um, some facial features and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes, my dear Karen, please, you have a question. Yeah, and um, can you hear me? I'm not sure it's working. Yes, we can hear you well. Okay. Um, uh, in some answered questions, uh, there is a passage of that where um, Abdul Baha is t speaking on certain Christian subjects, and one of them is makes a distinction of Adam and Christ. Uh, I, I, I came upon this when I was researching material for a recent devotional regarding um, uh, Easter Sunday for some of the participants. And so um, I'm just trying to find it here, um, where Abdu'l-Baha explains that Adam is the, the father of the material life of man is a living soul and that Christ was the cause of the spiritual life of man, a life-giving soul. And um, he was referring to some quotations from the Bible. And I'm wondering if, if that, um, is pertinent to this particular quote from Abdul Baha. Do you know of, of that passage? We also have the Adamic cycle and so on. So yes, probably there lived a prophet called Adam, but we are not sure whether this prophet was amongst the Hebrews or um, some other races. Because remember the Old Testament is written very much as a Hebrew-centric uh, book. It all talks about that small area. But also for your information, it's very interesting that the word Adam actually means human beings. In Persian, it's pronounced as Adam, means human beings. So you, when you want to say somebody should be a good human being, he's told, be Adam, be Adam. <laughs> so. These are going so much in the history. And Abdul Baha, we are so grateful that he constantly attempted to make sense of the scriptures of the past so that we are comforted that there is a link. And probably those references are about that. But exactly when did human beings walk on earth? Mm. Did we always walk on two feet? Probably not. Abdul Baha himself says, uh, human beings on earth have changed. Even at, at one time he states that we might have even had a tail. 
<laughs> he said, we have always been humans. He's referring to the essence of what we were, but not necessarily our physical features. Therefore, um, all those references to Adam and Adamic cycle and the uh, prophet of the past and so on, it all, it's so much uh, in the past history that we know very little about. So it's important to think that human beings have come through the same process that every other creature has come on earth except that this particular one had the design, if you like, intelligence design to become who we are and others have become other things. Abdul Baha says you hold a, a wrist full of seeds, all looking different, but more or less the tiny seeds, you throw them out in the garden. One grows to be a mighty oak tree <laughs> and what would be just a weed because they have within them the design of what they would become. But nevertheless, they go through the same process, which means they will go through the process of being planted and then growing and taking shapes and coming up to surface and so on. And human beings, we have gone through the same process of evolution as every living thing has but we have always intended to become who we have become. This is the only distinction we have between a Baha'i idea of evolution and other people who hold revolutionary, uh, evolutionary ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bayat. One thing that I also want to add on this slide, which is interesting, his audience here is a church and if you recall that he's, this is around 1912 in United, uh, Canada. And as you recall in uh, part 14, when I was giving um, an overview of the history of race, where it was coming, there was the ideas of polygenism and monogenism, right? And so here, Abdu'l-Baha is clearly stating that we are one have have one origin from Adam. So what would that theory be? It would be monogenism, right? So he's clearly putting down his foot and saying the ideas espoused by the polygenists are wrong. He does not accept them that there's these different groups and coming from different points of time. So Abdul Ba is saying that we are all coming from the same source. So this is what uh, being very clear by Abdul Baha here. Moving on. Thank you. That's a good point. Thank you very much, dear Tesfai. There is a number of important principles that form the core Baha'i perspective on race. So these are, I, there's several, 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 but I'm just going to be outlining them for you. One of them is, there is only one human species. And this is fundamental, right? One human species. And while the construct of race may represent some physical differences in humans, it has no basis in reality. And in fact, I just read the, in the Journal of American Medical Association that they have completely, categorically, fundamentally disproven any aspect of race. And I actually posted on my Facebook, and it's an incredible um, multi-page study showing the co complete fallacy of race within the history of medicine. And that's it's very interesting article. Therefore, discriminating against a particular group of people because of their physical characteristics, such as skin color, and depriving them of their basic human rights is unacceptable. This is as Baha'is and as world citizens, as members of this human race, this should be our, as uh, the beloved guardian says, this should be our call. We should, this should be on our lips. We should be championing this. That, um, and to the right, it says, 
We may have different religions, different languages, different color skin, but we all belong to one human race. And this is from the Supreme Body, the Universal House of Justice. It states that humanity constitutes a single people is a truth that once viewed with skepticism now claims widespread acceptance today. In the past, this idea that humanity constituted a single people? How could that be? Remember how many slides I showed you? We're all different. Huh? But now it is widespread acceptance. This is from the Supreme Body. In one line, they summarized my whole presentation. That's the beauty of the House of Justice. Isn't that amazing? So let us now get into this beautiful uh, part where it talks, and this is in paragraph 53, where the beloved guardian starts opening up about this positive discrimination in favor of minorities. So let us now have a reader. And our next reader is going to be, drum roll please, will be David. David, you're up. Yes, David. So go for it. The beloved guardian explains in paragraph 53 that the only acceptable discrimination based on race is that of positive discrimination in favor of minorities. The first obligation of any Baha'i is to nurture, encourage, and safeguard any minority within it, regardless of which faith, race, class, or nation they belong. Shoghi Effendi highlights a number of specific outcomes that should result from the significant, this significant principle. A, if an equal number of ballots are cast in an election for people from different races, faiths, or nationalities, then priority should be given to the person representing the min minority. B, it is the duty of every Baha'i community to arrange its affairs so that its diverse minority elements are represented in its assemblies, conventions, conferences, and committees. C, adoption of this principle will not only be a source of encouragement for minority groups, but it will demonstrate the universality of the faith of Baha'u'llah and its freedom from any type of prejudice. This is such a beautiful principle of the faith that as Baha'is, we promote, we work to safeguard are the minorities and when it's minorities it doesn't just mean uh, african americans it doesn't mean just asian americans or native americans it could be women it could be any aspect of minority within the community and we should be as keenly aware of those minorities so we can safeguard them and even in our language in our speech and um, not just holding on to our own areas, not being cliquish within our groups, even within our, for example, if, um, if we're Persians, we do not just go and talk in our own language, you know, that we are very cognizant and aware of who is around us, what is going on, so that we are aware so that we are safeguarding. The word is safeguarding, right? So that means to protect. We should never ever try to harm or hurt and to make sure that everyone is loved and protected and safeguarded in the Baha'i community. This is a very beautiful um, um, statement from the beloved guardian where that everyone is welcomed. And, and if it's in the sense of 
elections, if there is only one woman, imagine a community with, say, 12 men and one woman. That woman should always be represented on every institution. You see, this is where the faith is now, you know, taking that level and saying women in that community would be a minority and that woman should be represented. If that person was an Native American or African American or Asian American, that person should be on the institution. This is a minority. This is something that it states very clearly. And it says, then it talks about how the community should arrange its affairs so that its diverse minority elements are represented. Are we arranging our affairs? This is, but what affairs do we have in our community that we need to arrange, you know? Often we just talk about our holy days, but do our holy days represent the diversity of our community? The traditions within the community, the musical elements, the cultural elements, and bring those beautiful diversities to our celebrations, to our feasts. I think in a, a day or two is a feast coming up. How can you arrange your affairs so those diverse elements are represented? I attended one feast when I was in a teaching trip. This is an anecdote, as they say. I went, I attended a feast in North Carolina when I was, I think, 15 or 16 years old, when I traveled up to North Carolina. And when you're a young man, you know, and you think you have an idea of what Baha'i feast is, right? Because you've attended Baha'i feasts many, many times in your life. You think Baha'i feasts, you start with opening prayers. They're kind of like you fold your arms, you close your eyes. There's a chanting. There's, and then someone reads some prayers. And then that's the devotional portion. Then you hear some often, you know, dry materials, which goes on to the administrative portion. And then after that portion, then you start eating and chatting. And then that is the social portion. And that is the conclusionary part of feast, right? So not to belittle anything aspect of this most important institution, but this was kind of like, this is the Baha'i 19 day feast. So I attended a feast for the first time in North Carolina. It was in the Durham Raleigh area, which is interestingly now has, they're working to have this really incredible uh, advanced cluster of having its own now center area for development for almost mass and, you know, working with the Institute process. So I attended my uh, feast there when I was on a teaching trip. And it was my first time ever seeing the, the minority elements within a community participating as the majority elements of a community. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the minority elements in this community were the African-Americans, but they were so well represented in the feast that they were so encouraged that the musical selections, the, the encouragement, the beauty, the diversity was so enriched in that presence that the spirit was so on fire because they were so encouraged, so um, loved in that area that they just opened up and wanted to bring that to the feast. You see what I'm saying? And so this can happen in any community, but this is what I, I it was just an observation from my own personal life that they did it. They walked it, they talked it, and they brought that love to that African-American community in Raleigh, Durham area. And that community at that point in time, I don't know it as it is today, but I'm just sharing my anecdote that they really brought it. And it was such a vivacious feast and I felt it. So I share that anecdote. So you can see what is the, the that minority element, because it says that we should nurture it and cultivate it in all of our gatherings. That was a long anecdote. I apologize, but wanted to share that with you. And obviously, this adoption of this principle of the oneness of a mankind, of freedom of prejudice, should be the universal hallmark and standard of our life. 
as a Baha'i. Moving on, and so I hope this is bringing in some good uh, thoughts in your minds. So let's go to Jenny. You're up, Miss Jenny. Good to see you, and uh, you're our next reader. The principle of positive discrimination was built into the bylaws that govern the Baha'i Baha institutions in the United States and subsequently into other na national Baha'i communities. The application of this principle is illustrated in message sent by the Universal House of Justice to the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States, dated... Um, that is not correct, 35, but it, I believe it's 31. So there's no 35 days in a month. So just letting everyone know. Well, January 1967. Yeah, there you go. Uh, since the Guardian's instruction on this point is unequivocal, where it is obvious that one of the persons involved represents a minority, that person should be accorded to the priority without question. Where there is doubt further, Balloting will allow every voter present, present to participate. With reference to the provision in Article 5 of the National Bylaws governing the situation where two or more members have received the same highest number of votes, if one of those members represents a minority, that that individual should be given priority as if selected by lot. That, uh, thank you, Jenny. That is from the Supreme Body right there. So that is, if, if one of those members represents a minority, that individual should be given the priority. So this is the standard. And I have to correct that, I apologize. <laughs> okay. And in another of that letter written on behalf of the Supreme Body to the National Spiritual Assembly of the United Kingdom, and this is dated the 5th of March, 1986, some clarification is provided on the definition of a minority. The definition of a minority in any locality is in the discretion of the National Spiritual Assembly. It is clear that pioneers from other lands should not be regarded as belonging to a minority. Neither do the categories quoted by the Guardian in the advent of divine justice, namely faith, race, class, or nation, include sex. The overriding principle is always that if there is any doubt as to whether the minority principle should be invoked, then a further ballot should be taken. So uh, the National Spiritual Assembly of the United States has uh, legislated on what a minority is. It's, it's, uh, so we can always turn to them as the body. Sorry. Moving on, this is the, the picture on the right. It was one of the most beautiful pictures showing this freedom from racial prejudice that I ever came across. And I thought it was so cool of taking this string, this prejudice, just taking it from out of the head. So I thought it was a really cool illustration. So in paragraph 54, the beloved guardian observes that an increasingly large section of the human race was a victim of the brutality of racial prejudice at that time. Jure Effendi asserts that freedom from racial prejudice should be a core aim of the Baha'i community. It should be practiced in all aspects of their lives and be a keynote policy of the National Spiritual Assembly to facilitate its application to the community. And in paragraphs 55 and 56, Jure Effendi cites some references from Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha regarding the unity of mankind and abandonment 
of racial prejudice. And whenever I think about prejudice, I think of this big picture right here, because prejudice just sits in, on the cloud of the mind and this freedom of prejudice is kind of like just constantly pull. The more you pull, it seems just like there's more and more there and we have to keep working to eradicate it and get it all out. And this is a constant work that we have to work on ourselves. And in paragraphs 57 and 58, the beloved guardian states that tremendous effort is required by both races in their relationship with each other to reflect the spirit and teachings of the faith. They should abandon forever this false doctrine of racial superiority. So here we're seeing this term, tremendous effort, right? Tremendous effort always reaps success. It's a famous quote. And then it says, race hate isn't human nature. This is from Orson Welles. He says, race hate isn't human nature. Race hate is the abandonment of human nature. So that is a uh, beautiful uh, quote uh, that what is true race hate is the abandonment of being a true human. This is what, uh, what Orson Welles said. And you probably all have seen this quote, the root cause of prejudice is ignorance. Have, having these pre uh, prejudices that we harbor, this is just ignorance. And I love this quote. This is one of my top favorite quotes. And I share all these extracts. All, some of these are obviously not from the writings, but I love this quote. It says, no matter how open-minded, socially conscious, anti-racist I think I am, I still have all the learned hidden biases that I need to examine. It is my responsibility to check myself daily for my stereotypes, prejudice, and ultimately discrimination. So even though you might be open-minded and socially conscious and, and anti-racist, but you still have to check yourself, right? Every day. That and is true. Right, that's because right, you testify. And this is not, and this is not past. just calling out to whites. This is not just calling out to Persians. This is not just calling out to African Americans or Asian Americans or Native Americans or anyone. This is calling out to every one of us, because we all harbor prejudices. We all harbor um, any type, whether it's a sexist prejudice, whether it's a uh, whether it's a racial prejudice, whether it's any type of prejudice, we all harbor it and we have to bring ourselves to account. It is our responsibility, it says, to check myself daily for my stereotypes, prejudices, and ultimately discrimination. That's, I love this quote. Dude. That's, uh, that's why I shared it with, uh, with you so you could see it. So the beloved guardian, now this is getting into now, he's now going to be addressing, first he addresses the whites, then he addresses the blacks. So this is, he first turns to the whites. He says, surely if any provides a strategy for both white and black races to achieve freedom from ingrained prejudices. And this is in paragraph 58. This is what the beloved guardian says. He says the white race should make a supreme effort to contribute their share to the solution of this problem. They should abandon their usually inherent and at times subconscious sense of superiority. They should correct their patronizing attitudes towards members of other races. Persuade the black race of their genuine friendship and the sincerity of their intentions and show patience if no response is received from the black race. So one, two, three, four, five things right here. This is calling on the white race. Contribute their share to the solution of this problem. And it is a supreme effort. It's not, well, I kind of tried, you know, you know, yeah, I did pretty good effort a few years ago. That's not a supreme effort. So a supreme effort is, uh, you would say, it's a pretty, really hard effort. That's what I would say. It's constant even, you know, and you keep at it. 
It's almost like you're being in my class. I would say that's a supreme effort, <laughs> sticking through it, right? So this is a supreme effort, but a supreme effort in the sense of confronting racism within yourselves, within your community, within your reality. This is what is, needs a supreme effort to abandon their usually inherent and at times subconscious sense of superiority. How do you confront subconscious sense of superiority? And it's usually inherent. Inherent means what? That it's, it's there without you even knowing it, right? It's at all levels. So that is something that you have to abandon and then correct your, the patronizing attitudes towards members of other races. Then after you've done one, two, three, right? This is why the beloved guardian puts it in this order. So I would say after you've worked on one, two, three, then you can come to the table and persuade the black race of your genuine friendship that you're actually working on this, right? That you have tremendous effort working on it. You have some, so then you could say, hey, I'm genuinely working on this. This is what I'm doing. Then you could persuade the black race of your genuine friendship, your true sincere of your intentions. Because if, how could you say you're sincere of your intentions if you're not really working on it, right? So you got to be working on it. So that is, then you could say, I am sincerely working on this. This is what I am doing in, in my inner life and my outer life, my external conditions as a community. And then at the last one, the beloved guardian says, show patience, even if no response is received. So this is what the beloved guardian is saying. He's calling for the white race to make their effort. And I've summarized it again here. This is from my dear friend, Barbara Talley. I'm sure many of you know her. So she summarized this here. And um, she says, make a supreme effort in the resolve to contribute their share to the solution of the problem. Abandon once and for all their usually inherent and at times subconscious sense of superiority. Correct their tendency towards revealing a patronizing attitude. Persuade them through their intimate, spontaneous and informal association with them of their genuineness, of their friendship and sincerity of their intentions. And then last, master their impatience of any lack of responsiveness on the part of a people who have received, this is so amazing, who have received for so long a period such grievous and sl slow healing wounds. Slow healing wounds. It's like an open sore, dear friends. This pain, this suffering has not gone away. So this is what the beloved guardian is calling on whites, especially the whites, to make this supreme effort. So then I saw this graphic. This is an art installation on the campus of Temple University. And it was created by this uh, lady, Cara Springer. It was a, a Tyler sculpture graduate. The piece to the point says, white people do something, right? Could not be any more clear to me, right? It's saying, get up, do something. You see what is happening in society every week. Every week almost an African-American being, is being shot in our country every week. So it's calling, saying white people do something, arise. Do not let this injustice carry on. And this is another beautiful extract. It said, white supremacy won't die until white people see it as a white issue they need to solve rather than a black issue they need to empathize with. You see? This is a very powerful quote. If you see it as a, if they see it as a white issue and not just as a black issue, it is a human issue. This is our issue. When you see it as your own issue, you will see that 
It is not just something that you need to empathize with. It's something that you got to deal with. You'll be calling your congressman tomorrow and saying, what's up? My brothers and sisters are dying in the streets. This is something, a reality. What are you doing about it? Then we turn in that same paragraph, paragraph 58. I hope you guys are enjoying this because I'm enjoying this and it's powerful stuff. But this is something the beloved guardian is really hitting home on this then in, in paragraph 58, the beloved guardian turns to the black race and he, he says they should demonstrate a supreme effort by every means in their power in three different things. What does he say? The warmness of their response, their readiness to forget the past and their ability to wipe out every trace of suspicion that may still be in their hearts and minds. Warmness of their response, readiness to forget the past, and their ability to wipe out every trace of suspicion that may still be in their hearts and minds. Extremely hard. Both are extremely hard. But this is what we're called upon whether we're white or we're black, to do. And so I was thinking and meditating on the call here, the ability to wipe out every trace of suspicion, to forgive. Truly, this is forgiveness that the beloved guardian is talking about. Wipe out every trace of suspicion. How hard is that to do? So I saw some of my most favorite quotes, not only from Martin Luther King, to, from to others really talking about this importance of forgiveness. So I'm going to share these with you because I, how much I love Martin Luther King, so I share these with you. He says, we must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. He who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power of love. Let us read this one more time. We must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. He who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power of love. So we have to develop and maintain this capacity to forgive. This is another incredible quote I came across as I was researching what this forgiveness is. It says, forgiveness doesn't excuse their behavior. It doesn't excuse them. 400 years of slavery, it doesn't excuse it. But what does it do? Forgiveness prevents their behavior from destroying your heart. If we're not saying, hey, 400 years of slavery, that was okay. No, God, no. What we're saying is the, the beloved master, his holiness Baha'u'llah, doesn't want the hearts of the African-Americans to burn and suffer any more than they have. This is what he, he wants you to let go of that pain. Let go of that suffering. He doesn't, forgiveness prevents their behavior from destroying your beautiful hearts. You see, now we're getting to understanding the beauty of this forgiveness. You know what yes, please, dear testify. Yeah, yeah. You know, I I was in one Zoom meeting in Delaware Baha'is in uh, about uh, five months ago. When we talk about the race, there was one black Baha'i friend. He said that uh, I will forgive them spiritually, but not emotionally. That's what he say. And then I just wonder: is there any? Difference, forgiveness is forgiveness, but uh, I don't know what people are saying like that. But when you see the second, my second point is when you come to prejudice, the most important thing is, you know, as a Baha'is, the prejudices come basically from family. So we need to teach our families and then ourselves, starting from home and then going to the community and going to the nation. So we have a, a lot of responsibilities to come over all these difficulties. It's not about saying, talking, or 
coming together and share the idea, but we need to show it in action. If you don't do that, there is no meaning. Come together and talk and play and go home. So that is a process. Like if somebody has got wounded, the healing is takes a long time. That's why we need to be careful. So most of the time, we need to keep doing these things day by day. It's a process, like until we go to the next one. It's not an easy thing. You're absolutely right, dear Tesfaye. Absolutely right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It is a day by day work. It is something that we have to work on and bring ourselves to account, reflect on our own prejudices, and work on it's. We cannot just say, "Oh, I'm a Baha'i. I believe in freedom from prejudices." So I, you know, I agree with it. So I don't have any prejudices. So, you know, let's, you know, that doesn't, that ain't gonna work. And then we go and, con- you know, do microaggressions against this group or that group and create this unity within our community. This is not okay. We have to truly address these things. This is what it means to be a Baha'i. It means first be an active promoter of the oneness of humanity, active promoter of the oneness of humanity. And when we truly believe this, truly believe and have that love for every single person on this planet and internalize that love, we will work, this love will burn away these prejudices. And we got to increase that fire of the love of him inside of our heart. And so it burns these prejudices. So we love every single person on this planet, whether they they say bad things or not, we should love them. And, uh, you know, the example of Christ, where he says, look at the beautiful, you know, the qualities of someone, you look at and not the bad qualities, you know, I don't know if you know the story of when Christ walking, he saw, you know, um, a dead horse or, and he said, he said that what beautiful teeth, you know, it had, even though it was foul smelling and rotting, you know, it was a dead horse. And he said, what beautiful teeth it has. So we should look at the beautiful qualities of humanity. And look at that. And so our love burns away any prejudices that we have brought in inherently from, you know, our, as dear Tesfaya said, even from our families, from our culture, from anywhere in society, we've brought them into our own hearts and minds. So we work to eradicate them. This is again from my Martin Luther King Jr. This is what he says. Forgiveness is not an occasional act. It's not an occasional act. It is a constant attitude. This is from Martin Luther King. It's not an occasional act. Oh, yeah, I forgave him a while ago, but now I'm pretty upset with that guy. (laughs) And I'm still harboring a lot of anger and hate and animosity. And and God knows if I ever see that person, I'll take him out, right? No. It is constant attitude. And you see it in, in when it's in talking in about how the African-Americans should have that level of forgiveness. This is a constant act. And how much, how much, how tremendous effort it is for African-Americans to bring that constant act to the fully. You see how much suffering that it requires? That much tremendous effort that we're seeing here in that sense of forgiveness should be compensatory to how much the whites should bring. That supreme effort. You see what I'm saying? So this is something that this supreme effort that is required. This is from John Lewis, bless his soul. What an incredible soul. What he said was, you have to have the capacity and the ability to take what people did and how they did it and forgive them and move on. This is very powerful. You have to have the capacity. Remember who said the capacity and ability before? Martin Luther King, right? And this was a gentleman that was hand in hand marching with Martin Luther King. He said, you have to have this capacity and the ability to take what people did and how they did it, 
forgive them, and you got to move on. Cannot hold grudges because, as we learned earlier, this just hurts you. This hurts your own heart. This is from Maya Angelou. This is what she says. Stand up straight and realize who you are, that you tower over your circumstances. A lot of us may be living very wonderful lives, but a lot of us have suffered in the sense of you know, either persecution, discrimination in this country. This is a reality. But we shouldn't let our circumstances dominate us, control who we are, who we are. This is what my Angela says. Our circumstances, circumstances shouldn't control us. Stand up straight. We are noble creations of our Lord. And realize who you are that you should tower over your circumstances. Very powerful, Maya Angelou. What a beautiful poetess. And this is from Will Smith of all people. He says, throughout life, people will make you mad. How true is that? Disrespect you and treat you bad. Let God deal with the things they do because hate in your heart will consume you too. So this is talking about forgiveness, right? Do not let hate burn with us. Do not let it fester. It festers like an open wound. And actually, honestly, I believe that the, the mortality rate of African-Americans, the high mortality rate of African-Americans and indigenous peoples is related directly to this festering pain and suffering of African-Americans. It's not just related to whether it's obesity or the access to healthcare or all of these other problems. It's that they are so burdened with pain, so burdened with suffering, so burdened that their heart is consumed, that it's so hard to forgive, so hard to forget, so hard to move on that it consumes them. And there, that also is consequent to their high, higher mortality rate. But it's hard to do a medical study of that, you see? But I believe that that is the case. This is from Nelson Mandela. He says, as I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. And we know how many people are still in their own prison of their own realities. We got to let it go. Got to move on, as the beloved guardian says. Got to let that go. And this is another incredible quote. And I'm sorry, I have all these great quotes. And I have, you know, I wanted to share these with you because... It's just so powerful. This is a quote that says, the first to apologize is the bravest. The first to forgive is the strongest. And the first to forget is the happiest. Wow, truly an um, awesome quote. So who is the first to apologize? You know, who is the first to forget? And who is the first to forgive? These is the standard. Because the beloved guardian say, forget, forgive. And he's calling on the whites to apologize, right? And that requires a supreme effort. And he's calling on the, African, the, the, the African-Americans to forget and to forgive. So this is something that we should come to the table to, to make a reality. Then I found this cool poem. I know I found a lot of slides, but this is a cool poem. So I'll share this with you. This is from Sherry Eckert. It says, it's called That One. It says, be that one. That one who forgives when deep offense has been committed. That one who loves when no one else does. That one who gives kindness to those who are mean. Be that one who looks past the insult 
instead seeing the pain that motivated it, that one who shines light upon those who sit in utter darkness, because the impact of being that one runs far and wide. It brings healing to the wounded, joy to the sad, and hope to those in despair. Be that one. Be a Baha'i. This, and you can see how similar this beautiful poem is to that be generous in prosperity. Be, you know, the, all the beautiful aspects of what does it mean to be a Baha'i? Be that one. Be the, you know, it's such a, uh, I, I wanted to share that with you. And then this is from Abdul Baha, and you can see his, what this aspect of moving the pain from the heart is. And you see it in this uh, extract. If one of you has been wounded, and there's three E's, that's a mistypo. I don't think Abdul Baha put three E's there. If one of you has been wounded in the heart by the words or deeds of another, forgive him now that in purity of heart and loving pardon, you may feast in happiness and arise renewed in spirit. So here, Abdul Baha, the reader of all hearts, says, let go of that pain, right? He says, if you have been wounded, if you've been hurt, your heart has been stabbed, an arrow has pierced your heart, he says, do what? Forgive him now. Then he says that in the purity of heart and loving pardon, he says, your heart may now feast in happiness and you will become a new creation. You will arise renewed in spirit. Isn't that beautiful? I love it. Brings you so much happiness. What a great quote. So now... Okay, let me check my time. 8.27. We'll uh, pause right here. Any thoughts ex on so far? I hope all these quotations might change our hearts for the Baha'is. I hope so too, my dear Tesfaya. I hope so too. They are great quotations. Thank you very much for collecting them. And we can read it every time. So, and we can share it. So it's beautiful, really nice. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Any other thoughts? We're 828. I, I have another little section coming up. I don't want to jump into another full-on section, but so we'll stop right there. Um, any other thoughts uh, on the extracts for tonight? Well, what I want to say is, you know, there is a guy that I told you that when you are forgiven, only spiritually or emotionally. So how can the forgiveness is to be? Forgiveness is totally forgiveness, right? There is no distinction between spiritual and emotional or something like that, to my understanding, but I don't know. That's correct. There's no like, well, I kind of forgive him up here, but down here, no, I don't forgive him. You know, it's all or none. That's the reality. Forgiveness is forgiveness. And... That's why it's a hard thing, dear Tesfai. It's forgiveness is often. Yeah, because so you say hard. that uh, three or four of his generation died and killed every time. And then he was so much crying and then say like that. And it is very hard to bring this kind of topic. You know, it is very painful. And uh, I don't know what I can say. It's, it's, it's very tough. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, the feeling of some people is very unique. Sure. And you can see how important this as a subject is to bringing unity within our Baha'i community and then unity within the greater society, you see? And you can see that as dear Deborah mentioned earlier, that this principle of the oneness of humanity, the oneness of mankind, it is the prescription for this day and age. So it just makes sense. So that's why as Baha'is, often this was the word oneness of mankind. Yeah, that's what I, how I became a Baha'i because yeah, I accept that. It makes sense. So if we truly not only internalize it and then work to transform our Baha'i communities and make this per se, the, the field of the oneness of humanity, 
this then we can invite the greater society and say hey this is a model this is what we should be working towards and say yeah this is this is where it's working you and so that's what as uh the beloved guardian is saying this is what we should be working towards and it's something that it is a lifetime effort it's as uh they have been saying it's not just like yeah i forgave a while ago or you know i this was just a one time effort and then from rectitude of conduct to chaste and holy life to now freedom from prejudices and you're going to now in the upcoming parts you'll see how they are not only tied together but they are the requisites for teaching in all phases and you're going to see this coming up and it's it's going to be really cool but without any further ado i'm going to call on my dear friend um drum roll please uh my dear friend any other comments here before we please go? dr bite before we close you have the floor you know we have all often said the pivot around which all the teachings of the faith revolve and the unique mission of the bahai faith is the unification of mankind but the quotes that we heard today on eliminating prejudices of all forms of it and recognizing our unity are what makes us to understand what we meant by unity of mankind it's not just a nice sentence to make it's it's what this faith is built for thank you that's right you know what he he remind you now dr bayat that now we are entering a big university that we can never come gr graduate out from this it is keep going all the way to life <laughs> That's right, dear Tesfai. We have to not only mentally study, but spiritually work on ourselves. That is the, where the true university should be working. You know, not just acquisition of knowledge, but really develop ourselves to become the best individual we could ever be, so that we could be. as close and work and as close to becoming that example of what abdul baha was you know we trying to reflect so we this is what we should be working on it's not just a as a, a university for i know everything about iran i know everything about advent of divine justice i know everything but it's to become walk it do it and that's what the faith means because that we can this is about inner life outer life inner life outer life being a bahai and anyway dear friends we are 10 three minutes over so we should have a closing prayer and i wish you such a wonderful session and next week we'll close on this uh, part of um uh, the bahai perspective on racism but then we start entering into the double crusade and we'll have a wonderful dear roy john will be championing this section and so will be and that will be in 2 weeks so next week i will finish up this section and then roy john will be helming that section and so it will be very exciting okay so without any further ado i will anyone that would like to share a prayer please go ahead jenny you have the floor please <laughs> Labor is needed if we are to seek him ardor is needed if we are to drink of the ha the every union with him labor is needed if we are to seek him ardor is needed if we are to drink of the ha the every union with him and If we taste of this cup we shall cast away the world we shall cast away the world Beautiful 
Beautiful, Jenny. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. Thank you. Good to Thank see you, Don, David, Kathy, Claudia. So good. Miss Carla. Roya. So happy to see every Hi. one of you. Thank you. Beautiful Thank faces. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a wonderful week, everybody.